day, folks. Welcome to this first episode of 20 Questions, where you get to put the questions to one of your Dundalk FC heroes. And um, delighted to say our first episode is joined by manager Vinnie Paird. Vinnie, how are you keeping? Yeah, uh, all safe and well. Um, struggling in lockdown, but we have to do what we have to do. And um, it's been difficult, um, but it's the same for everybody. It's been, it's been a, a strange time because got a lot of contact with a lot of fans over myself, the players, led by Eilish Kelly, brilliant initiative. And, uh, it's been real interesting. It's been an opportunity to reach out to people. And I have to say, um, I think whenever there's a saying that we're all in this together, I think the moment is, is very much uh, rings home. I think we're all in this together and we battle through this together, you know? Yeah. It seems like a long time ago, that last game up in Finn Harps, isn't it? Yeah, it's... It, it hurt me a little bit because it was in a performance. I felt, uh, and I said at the time, we we five, really missing five attacking players and probably six of you add Nathan into that who came in later on in the week. We were six attacking players short of um, our optimum and uh, we played so well up in Finn Harps. McElhenney was back and Murray was very close. Dara Leahy was close. Um, John Mountain, he was getting there. So, um, Georgie Kelly was just over that injury he had, so uh, Stefan was was on the pitch. He hit the post, so a lot of positives, and uh, just feels like you've been stopped. But look, um, there's there's more important issues at the moment than football, so we we'll wait our turn. What what are what are the players up there? You know, say a lot of them have gone home to England, and you know, Stefan 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 Stefan's still in the dog. I believe he can't he can't go back to Serbia because the borders are closed over there. Yeah, it's been difficult for a couple of people. They, like, you know, players, players who could go back to England, of course, we encourage it because, you know, it's such a delicate time. If anything happened to anybody's family member and you were stuck, it would be a horrible feeling. So, uh, But a lot of lads are still around. A lot of lads are, you know, in regular contact with each other. Um, players are working really hard under um, um, Danny Miller, under Graham Norton and, and, and David uh, Murphy. They've really led them. Like I'm, I've seen some of the sessions they've done individual. It, it sounds like oh, they're at home doing their own programs, but it's been really well monitored. I've often said that that department, I'm trying to drive this club to be a European level club. I think the department of the SNC and our, and our medical department are at that level, and it's been proved now. Um, I also had a, a Zoom call with every player today uh, around two o'clock. So that was interesting. Um, some of the hairstyles is, is, is scary. I think Gary Rogers' hair is about to grow back. He's been in <laughs> lockdown. Uh, Michael Duffy and Georgie Kelly, two of the most soft-spoken people in the world, look like two lads have just been let out of Mount Joy. So it's quite interesting. There's a lot of and and Pa Hoban looks like something out of the '60s. So it's 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 quite an interesting uh, array of of sort of the hairstyles and probably the the most interesting one is is Daniel Cleary has long blonde hair down nearly down to his shoulder it's fascinating so really interesting uh zoom call today and uh, yeah the lads are as always in good spirits uh, everyone is fit and healthy and um as a manager that's all, all you care about the staff and, and your players are really healthy yeah they obviously the target is still june for the, the league to resume but can i ask you last week uefa said that the qualifiers for the champions league can be pushed back are you, are you happy with that yeah, well, I suppose we want to play matches in as quickly as possible, but obviously we're, everything is dictated by health uh, and everybody being safe, whether it's the players or people going to the ground. So, yeah, look, we have to drive towards the target of, 9th, of the 19th of June as a restart date. Giving us a few extra weeks being ready for Europe is important because that's where we've had an advantage over the last few years as Irish clubs. So I think that's a good thing. Um, other clubs I see you may or may not be an opportunity this year other leagues are in the same boat as us so we've got to be ready we've got to be prepared and, and again that's why the work that's going on in our in our medical and department is so crucial at the moment yeah good stuff good stuff right are you ready to launch into these these questions yeah I haven't seen them yet so I can only imagine you're sitting there you're sitting there look, you're looking a wee bit nervous Um Right, question one from Evan Gilson in, on Instagram. How do you think football has changed in Ireland since you were a player compared to now? Well, yeah, it's a, it's a good question, uh, Evan. Is it? It's a great question because it's it's something that's not 
spoken about people look back in old times with rose rose tinted glasses i feel the the you know even in even in our own sort of this current era you look at 2015 and you look at how we won the league this season that there it was remarkable we won this season at ease this year go back to 2015 or you go back to the, the late goal by Richie Tell down in Athlone in the 91st minute and we just about, you know, we lost out in Bray, all of these different things. They they sort of got forgotten about in time. But the game has changed for so many reasons. I suppose off the pitch, uh, you certainly wouldn't be doing a Zoom call. If we'd have been in lockdown back in 2003 and four. we would have been sending a hell of a lot of letters out to people via the email. So Wi-Fi wouldn't have been as strong. So the world has changed. Technology has Technology has changed, and all of that has had a knock-on effect. That players are so much fitter, healthier, uh, they understand the game more, they're seeing more matches, and I think the game is is a hell of a lot more technical now than it ever was. It used to be a four-four-two, uh, and coaches used to say to you, and some of the best coaches I played under would say, "You just got to win, beat the battle against the man you're playing against, and if we win enough of them battles, we win the match." Now it's more. There is a, a, a almost a chess element to the game. People play so many different systems, and it's fascinating. I think the game now is a real. You, you've got to be tactically switched on, not just as as a as a coach, but certainly as a player. And it's one of the reasons this year there was a lot of discussions around why I tried three, three five three four three in um, in the off season, and, and one of it was. Not necessarily that system we use, but it's a, it was definitely about um, players understanding understanding positions and part of, of their education. And uh, I think, by and large, the players really enjoyed that system. So, uh, great question. I think the game, the world has changed. And as a result, uh, it's certainly much quicker and more tactical uh, than it ever was. Uh, and, and it's better for it. Yeah. Two, two similar sort of questions, so I put them into one from Brendan Kelly and Niall Woods. Who has been the biggest influence on your career to date and who did you look up to when you were younger? Um, I suppose when, when I was younger, um, that, that sort of, you won't like this, Gavin, but that Liverpool team of, of particularly around 88, 89, uh, Kenny Dogleash was a real hero and a style of play. I really loved that. Um, Remember his goal against Chelsea to win a league in the old Stamford Bridge and uh, took it on his chest and hit it in the far corner himself and Ian Rush and that sort of combination. Um, the, the, you know, Ronnie Whelan, John Barnes, Peter Beardsley. That sort of team uh, for me was, and, and Kenny Dalglish was player manager, that was, that was really what got me my first love for football. Um, in terms of my biggest influence, I've, I've had a good few of them. Um, there's no doubt... Um, you know the previous manager of our club gave me a huge opportunity and I probably wouldn't be where I am today only for him now I think sometimes you have to say it. he might be where he was today if it wasn't for the likes of me either and people in Dundalk but um, I suppose someone like John Wilkes is, was a man at Cherry Orchard a Leinster Senior League man a lot of the time some of my team talks go back to certain things he would say to me uh, he was very hard on me as a player, but if, if I scored twice, he would give out to me about mistake in a game. If I didn't play that well, he'd remind me how good I was the week before. So someone like John Wilkes, it's just one example, was a real sort of, um, really steered me in terms of where I was coming from, the football point of view. And um, I've always been wanting, wanting this sort of coaching or this management element of it. So I would have listened and I would have been Going into a lot of people, so there's a huge amount of people who played a big part in, in, in what I achieved. Just two, two questions related to that. You said Conal Megan was asking, "Did you always want to go into coaching?" Which you're after saying you did. And Shane Kerr is asking, "Which manager or coach do you look up to because of the, the way their teams, they set out their teams, their style of play?" Which which manager or coach would you look at and think, "Yeah, that's the way I want to set up my team." Yeah, again, um, again, you won't be happy with this. Like the obvious question, the obvious answer to that is everyone wants to play like Jurgen Klopp at the moment. Okay, but the where, where Kenny, this is going <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that, but I suppose <laughs> where I'm quoted from is you can't, everyone can't be like Liverpool. Okay, you, everyone can't be, um, you know. But 
when you look at that style of play, yes, that is one. Like, but you pick up from so many different things. The reason why you would look at teams like Liverpool, uh, Celtic, massively the way Celtic would create overloads and breaking down teams is that so often we would have we would have to break down a lot of teams, particularly at home. We'd have a lot of the ball and you're trying to pick from these different people how they do it. And um, I, I like the way the Celtics set up because of the league. They are or the dominant side or one of the, the two dominant sides. Um, but I've a real grow recently towards the way uh, Paris and Germain have set up. Not necessarily a big fan of, of how they've got this sort of galactical team together, but their style of play, uh, the coach, Tukan, uh, really, really impressive. I really like what they do. Again, I'd love to coach them one day because I think if they could improve their fullbacks, if they had Liverpool's fullbacks, they can win the Champions League. So I do be fascinated to watch them. Um, so it's a, it's a whole mixture of teams like that where you're really looking to see, um, again, first time crosses into the box from, say, a team like Man City. Is that something we, we can replicate? And I think. Uh, if people look back on some of our games this season, they will see some of the some of those trends uh, coming into our, our team. Yeah, there was a question further on, but I think it, it relates to this. It was from Daniel Sexton on Twitter saying, "Do you enjoy watching football in your spare time? And if you do, do you go, do you go out of your way to watch a team, or would you just, if there was any game on, would you just sit and watch it?" No, uh, unless I, I felt it was a purpose to watching a game, I wouldn't really watch it. Right. Uh, I'd watch a lot. Uh, I'd watch a lot of Championship football. So if if Premiership was on and Southampton were playing Newcastle on the so-called Super Sunday, I'd have no real interest in that. That for me, depending, could be not a waste of time. So uh, I pick and choose my games. Um, when you're in this role and the way again technology has changed, by Sunday afternoon I've probably got every game in the league on on my laptop. So I'll probably pick out one of them to watch. Not necessarily some we're playing the following week, but you know, just that that would I get more out of that than watching Southampton and uh, say a Newcastle for everyone's sake. So again, I would watch a lot of um, football from around the world. You know, I'm bored a little bit of the Premiership. I'm yeah. bored of a lot of games in it. Um, so when I can, I'll watch the teams like as I said, Paris Saint Germain. French football is really good. I think Italian football was really coming back. Uh, I'm very, very interested. Um, so the answer to it is depending depending on where we're at. But I'd watch a hell of a lot of League of Ireland football, but not necessarily football from all over the world. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, Fintan Kieran on Twitter. Uh, you obviously played with them, Dalk, before you, you, you joined back in 2012 on the coaching staff. But what was your impression about the club when you came back in 2012? Yeah, yeah, I suppose I, I do remember Stephen ringing me um, prior to, and again, with this stuff, I don't know whether he actually had the job at that stage, but I remember him ringing me saying Dundalk had, had offered him a job, I think it was in the November time, if I'm not mistaken, and um, I just asked him my opinion on him. I would have been close to him over the years for different things like that, and um, I remember saying to him, like from playing there, like, they're a bloody big club, they're one of the biggest we've forgotten, because... Because Dundalk struggled for you know a number of years, first division got promoted, then didn't get promoted, all of that stuff. It, it, it's a little bit uh, you, you can't forget how big some clubs are, um, it, like Dundalk. And around that time, people had forgotten how big Dundalk could be and, and could and had the potential to be. Again, I remember playing for them in in first division grounds or even in in Oriel Park and being over a thousand pound, a thousand people there. That's not the norm for a first division club. So I always knew they were big and I remember saying to him, this is a big club. This is one of the big, we, we forget the history of this club. And um, not that he needed my advice, but it was sort of uh, very clear that Dundalk had left a big lasting impression on me. Um, I struggled in the club when I played there. Uh, didn't play a hell of a lot of matches. I think I started close to 12 games over a season through injury. But, uh, and I felt I owed them something that's, it's probably the only club like that at the time I felt I'd been at and hadn't made a difference or left a mark on it. So it was, it was amazing for me to go back and actually leave a mark on the club as in winning the league with them and, and being part of the success over the last seven years. 
A uh, good question from th th three three sort of people asked nearly the same question: Dylan Smith, Connor Smith, and Sophie Smith. Uh, I don't know whether they're related, but what's your favourite memory from this, your seven years at Oriel to date? Um, I, I suppose um, for I again I know that they replayed the Maccabi game in Tala recently on on the clubs. Uh, was it on Facebook or on the Facebook. club accounts? Um, for me, from a purely coach's point of view, uh, I was around in, in, in 16. I sometimes feel you need to remind a few people. <laughs> but uh, for, me, uh, for me, that was that was the most perfect performance. from, And I watch a lot of European football. When it, no matter who's playing in, in League of Ireland team is playing in a European game, I'll go to it if I can. I think it's usually beneficial. So I think that was the most complete performance we've ever had in Europe. Yes, we've had the bad day nights and we've gone so close and Zenit and all of it, but we were so totally in control in that game. Um, and that week, uh, for me as a coach, um, remember I done a lot of the analysis at the same time as there. We we the small staff. It was me and Stephen and Jerry Spain at the time was part time. And for me as a coach, that gives me the most satisfaction uh, from the tactical point of view. Um, from how, how we managed the team, we picked the team, we played Patrick off the right, if I remember, and um, you know, the changes we made, but we, we were the dominant side, like we won a European game at group stages level and we deserved it. And I've done a huge amount of work that week with the players, uh, through video and on the training ground. And when everything comes, comes to plan as such, it's probably the most proudest moment I've ever had. I remember sitting there with four or five minutes to go. Normally you're in a bit of a panic going one it was only one nil going, will we hold on? But I was so proud of 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 what the players have achieved and I suppose what I was part of. Uh, that was the one night that, that will always stick with me. That was that was where we belonged at that level. Absolutely. Yeah. If you if you could go back and change one result over the seven years, what would it be? Would it have been any of those European games that followed that? Um, yeah, we, we should have been Zenit at home. Mm. We should have. Um, we, we let them off the hook and we made mistakes from the sideline as well. We got things wrong. Uh, we should have beat them at home and I think if we'd have beat them at home we would have got out of the group. Yeah. Uh, so that one, that, that is one result. We, should have, we just should have beat them. Um, we had the measure of them at home. Again, tactically we were spot on. But neither the fullbacks were were absolute raiders or bombers, so we knew that we could we could deal with them with what we had, and um, we took the lead. Day Massey hit the post to go two 0 up, with about thirty minutes to go. I'm going to say 25, 30 minutes to go. I think that goes in. We win that game and we get out of the group and we're in the last thirty two. Um, so that's something that will that 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 result will haunt me for for ever and a day. I think last year, before the Carabag game, I think you said Zenit probably the best best side you've 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 come up against. Would you still still say that? To, still say that now? Yeah, they certainly had the best players. Absolutely, best players. The fourth year we played Bate Borisov, they were they were, they were brilliant. Yeah. And again in 2016, the Bate Borisov team we played fell apart in Talib, but over there, that was the biggest pace that we ever got as a team. Away in bad day, and we lost one nil and one three nil at home. So that bad day team was a, was a proper proper team, and um, particularly uh, the team the year before, and 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 even in sixteen, that, they they were exceptional but for player for player wise, like um, Zenit. But again, they didn't have loads of pace, so it helped us. They didn't hurt us, and Giuliano was very good in the number ten, but they didn't have. I think it was Crescito was the left full. And again, he was more of a centre-half yeah. converted. But he wasn't going to hurt us. Uh, remember Stasevich for, for Bate, like what a player he was with the pace. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, pace at that level is what can hurt you um, in, the, in the top game. So Bate and Zenit were the, were the best sides we would have met. Uh, Zenit taking it because of the quality they have. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, Mark Q on Facebook. Now, I'll phrase this properly because people will only be writing stories out of it. 
of all the players that have left in North FC since you joined the club seven years ago, which one would you have liked to have kept? I'm not going to say love to take back because we a headline tomorrow saying you're in for somebody, but which which one of them would you have liked to have kept? Um, that, that's a difficult one. Like, I, I mean, Horgan in 16 was international class, but Town in 15 was international class as well, to be fair to him. Um, um, so there's no doubt the two of them were just brilliant footballers. Um, I suppose for loads of different reasons, just like particularly in my role, I got so close to so many players. Like Curtis Bourne was a real favourite of mine. Darren Meenan was someone that I just I just got him like and people always people presume someone like Darren might be hard work. Easiest one of the easiest lads you'll ever you'll ever coach. Um it's a difficult one to answer because we've had so many good, good players. Like, um, it's it's very, very difficult. I, I I wouldn't do anyone a disservice of leaving them out. Like, we've we've had a lot of good people. Like Dave McMillan um, is always someone that uh, I would nearly consider a, like a little brother. Like he's someone I I really, really, really admired as a person. So, you know, McMillan uh, tell. Horgan, they're certainly up there on, on, on the list of, of that, there's no doubt. Yeah, not a bad tree. Um, just talk about you taking over, Vinny. Uh, a lot of questions. It was mentioned at the time, obviously, when you, 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 you took over as head coach, but did you feel much pressure sort of taking over from Stevens, obviously, regarded as the, the best League of Ireland manager ever? But did you, obviously, did you feel that pressure when you, when you, when you took over as, as head coach? Um, yeah, of course there's pressure. Um, I mean, it wasn't long after the whole David Moyes thing was going around. and um, Again, another dig at you, your own Manchester United love. <laughs> love in. But it wasn't long after that. and you were, you, There was this thing of, you know, are you making a mistake following such a, uh, such a big name? And... Um, People, some people would say I had the easiest job in football, like best players, team had just won the league. I would say it would be easier to build a team. Uh, I often laugh at some managers say, you know, after losing a game or two, they're able to say, you know, we're building for the future and this team is only young and getting there. I go, I wish I had that. We lost two games last year and it was a major catastrophe. Look, uh, so um, it was a difficult, there was pressure there. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I felt comfortable in my own skin because, again, despite what everyone would tell you, or not everyone, despite what some people would tell you, like, I'm into my eight year at this club. I've been around it for a while. Uh, so as part of the team, as part of the group, um, no matter what happens to this group, we've lost a lot of big names. Not just, uh, wasn't a, it was never a one-man band, but we've lost people like Hoobins Golds, uh, people said we couldn't replace them. Powell, we couldn't replace them. Horgan and Boyle, we couldn't replace them. Um, McMillan, we couldn't replace them. And we've replaced them. Uh, O'Donnell left. And, you know, after so many big name players and the big manager not there last season, no matter what anyone tells you, in the history of Dundalk, you'll go a long way to find a league title that was won easier than how we did it last year. Uh, and the manner in which we've done it, we went 15 points clear with five games to go. That's that's unheard of in in in, in modern times. So um, we we done okay, and um, ultimately we survived the the pressure or the noise from the outside. But internally, it was quite calm. You say you've been the club. This is eight years. Your seven years is the 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 number two. What was the biggest change going from being a number two? To, to being the number one. Obviously, you have a different relationship then with players. You're, you're the one responsible for picking them and, and leaving them out. But what, what was the biggest change that you you noticed? Um, well, the obvious, yeah, the obvious one is the players and picking players and letting people down. Like, I used to be able to joke a lot with them and say, in, in the warm-up, I'd say, well, if I was the gaffer, I'd pick you. It was my little way of with the player. And I had good enough relationship with the players to be able to say that in, in the sense of, uh, to break break the ice a little bit, uh, but 
ultimately the, the big difference is that you, you've got to leave people out. You've got to, you're effectively changing people's lives if you're letting them go, if you're signing people, if you're, if you're moving people on. Um, that's the biggest change. The other, the most obvious other one is that, again, and it, some of it's down to my own thinking, I, I, I feel strongly that a good assistant is sort of seen, not even seen, not heard, just in the background. My work was Monday to Thursday. Match night was warm up and then sit in the background. I wasn't one for jumping on the manager's shoulders or lifting trophies or running down the pitch or any of that stuff. When it was on, when I needed to fight the team's case, don't get me wrong, we all know uh, I wasn't afraid to do that when it came to sideline battles. But I was in the background. And um, so it, throughout that time in 16, there isn't loads of photographs of me around the place or jumping up and down. Uh, because I feel that's important that, you know, after a big game, I remember after a big cup final, we won that. Um, I was chatting to two players who never got on and somebody took a photograph on. And actually that photograph would mean more to me than lifting the trophy because that was my role. So I got you go from that to, um, like the way I celebrated in Riga was yeah. so unlike me. But I felt that was, or, or in Tala last season, in front of the fans. I felt that was a big moment for us, big moment for us in the season, a uh, big moment in winning the league. And uh, I felt it was time we, we had connected and it was my responsibility to thank them on behalf of the players and that. And I celebrated in that manner. So putting yourself out there um, and, and putting yourself in the limelight, that's, that's the biggest change. Um, and it, at times it's the most difficult because... It doesn't suit everybody, you know. What about dealing with players? You said, you said there when you were assistant Monday day, Thursday, you'd be on the training ground. But I'm sure when you when you go home from the training ground, obviously you're, you're you're still thinking about the game, but you don't have to deal with players and the personal lives and the problems that you know that they might have. I'm sure that was all. <coughs> that was a, a new experience last season. Yeah, it was, but. Um... I, like you don't like with twenty four players in a given season twenty to twenty four you don't get on with all of them that way as as best like but I always felt like they were they were like little brothers to me they were always felt that they were people that would come to me with problems they did as players the certain problems you you don't want the manager to know about because it might make him go oh well I might leave him out if I felt it was important enough I'd obviously bring it to the manager's door that was the role of the assistant. And then, so when it changes, um, you know, you've got to, as I said, you've got to make decisions that they're not necessarily going to like. Um, you, but you also have to, um, they have to want to play for you. Uh, they have to want to feel part of, of what you're trying to achieve. You've got to set goals. Um, I, think, I think we've changed a lot of what we've done last season from where we were moving into the YDC, the professionalism that came into the club, um, you know, the implementation of, of GPS to, the, to a new level, you know, our strength and conditioning work, our double sessions, all of that stuff. I think we changed, we improved the club and on the back of that then, um, most of the players in our squad, ultimately, the winners. And if they're not playing, um, but they're part of something that's successful, they can live with that to a point. Um, but, um, they've got to have goals and, and last year we went after a treble like, and we were a penalty kick away from it and uh, so they had goals and they all feel they played a part in it I think and um, so the relationship with them some of them I know seven years obviously and some of them I, I, I only know a year or two and they only see me as the manager so they're, they're work in progress and I'm, I'm comfortable we've got most of it right yeah a uh, question from Orla Crilly. What's the most challenging part of your, of your job? Um, I suppose, uh, you know, you're making life decisions for your players. Yeah. Um, you know, there will be a day where, you know, one of, I've had so much with, with some of these players for seven years. There is going to come a day where I'm going to have to say to one of them that the time is up in the club. Mm. That's something that... I, that's not something that you look forward to. Like, as I said, the like little brothers. So you're dealing with players is, is, is you. That's, that's probably the most challenging part. And to be honest with you, the other, side, the other part of it is 
being upfront and honest is the amount of media work involved with the game now, the amount of people you, genuinely could be an hour to an hour and a half after the game answering questions and it is it is a difficult strain on on uh, managers, not just me, but there is so much need and it's great and you've got to do it because if we don't promote our own our own league, then who's gonna do it? We can't wait for people. So I'm more than willing to do it, but it is it is a challenge. Just on that point, Vinny, it's it's a everything the, the way the world is now, everything has to be done now and there's such a there's such a an instant reaction. Like you mentioned the two games last year against Sligo and Pats and it was like the world was 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 caving in. Do you know is that hard to deal with now that everything you know if you lose one game all of a sudden you know the wheels are falling off is it is it hard to deal with that um yeah i suppose it is um you the fact is though um i'd be very pragmatic at times so like the first league we won in this modern era we went into the last game of the season after losing to bray and behind cork and we ultimately went and won that match. So you need little things to go your way. The 92nd minute penalty Richie Tell got when Darren Meenan fell over quite easily in that loan, when things got have to go your way at different stages. So you don't always get to rub of the green. And it was interesting. Um, I was listening to Catching Up on some TV last week and um, Gary Neville was making the point. He, he was doing the soccer box, I think it is, with, with Stephen Gerrard that, you know, United in the good times, he was saying, took some hammerings. Yeah. But they're forgotten about, like, you were beaten 5-0 by Newcastle, I remember. Liverpool had the, when United were really strong, had a, had a spell where he won a lot of games against them. I think there was a 3-0 with Gerrard, got a hat-trick. And in time, they're forgotten about. But in this modern era we live in, um, I was just reviewing the game, the, the uh, Ireland and Italy in 94. And if, if that game was played now, social media would hammer some of the decisions some of the players made because they're obviously playing on the jack and they were kicking the ball back. But, you know, the game has changed now because of, of social media, because of uh, immediate reaction. I'll, I'll never forget when they introduced the new penalty shootouts where they went alternative. There were three penalties in and I did it just for... I, I went on to Twitter just to see... And those people giving out about him, well, it hasn't even finished. So that's the sort of reaction we get now. Um, so is it a bad thing? I don't, I don't know. My opinion is people aren't enjoying the games anymore. They're, they're looking for little angles and they're not re- relaxing. And I also think we're looking back, as I said, with rose into the glasses, remembering these days as if, you know, um, remembering them that there's something better than they actually are. So... I think people should just relax, enjoy sport. And the Vatten at this time is teaching us is when the sport does get back, put your phone down, just sit back, put your feet up and watch it and enjoy it, or else go to it and watch it live, and whatever the case may be. Yeah, good stuff. Um, Alan Moore on Instagram, uh, interesting question. Has there been a change to Dundalk's style of play since Stephen Kenny left? And if so, what, what have they been? Do you think there's been any change, or have you... Have you deliberately come in and said there is things I want to change about the the way we used to play? Um, I suppose last season we our first game we lost McElhenney, uh for ten twelve weeks and we lost um, Robbie Benson for good to six months. Um, so that was a midfield completely ripped. We've always played midfield with that sort of one one and one shields and a number eight and a number ten, not two and one or any of that stuff. Um, you know, we replaced Daniel Kelly, or we replaced Dylan Connolly with Daniel Kelly predominantly, and we played Michael Duffy on the other side and John Mentley. wasn't wasn't loads of change. The structure of the midfield was affecting. We weren't close enough to Pat. We missed the number ten, and uh, we didn't have a number ten close enough to him uh, to run in behind them. It's something we always had, and um, we didn't have that midfielder breaking into the box. We had different styles. So, it wasn't exactly last season how I would like to play. At times it was. Like our performance, particularly away in Waterford and away in Sligo, were as good as any domestic, our best domestic performance in my time at the club was away to Waterford when we won 3-0. We were absolutely outstanding. So um, 
the, the style hasn't changed. But this year, I think we've started to see a change in style. The, the performance against Sligo, where we played with two number, or against Shelbourne, where we played with two number eights. Yeah, we conceded a goal, but that force for uh, 60 minutes against Shelbourne, we were excellent. That's something we've been working on, creating little triangles again. That's something that, say, someone like Celtic would play that way. Again, making the team better. We didn't have a number 10 for that game. Yeah. Um, and so we've had a lot more crosses into the box this season. Um, I think in the Cork game, we'd, we'd over close on 30 crosses into the box, something we worked on. So there is, naturally, there is things I want to, to improve the team on and, and involve them. Um, but, you know, what's, what we have is not broken and it hasn't already changed. Remember, I was the coach for those, for many damn years. So my beliefs were coming out in the team as well as the managers, obviously. Um, so there isn't big changes, uh, but there is areas of improvement in our squad. How, you've, you've, you've said this to me before before we went in the break, but you're genuinely excited with the attacking players that you have now at your disposal with Kolovic. Nathan Nadu, I think, was, was, was settling in nicely in training. We've got Will Patching, Cammy Smith, obviously Patrick McElhinney's back. You, you, you're really looking forward to getting those players, you know, getting the season back up and getting those attacking players on the pitch. Yeah, I suppose, like, it's interesting because what we've done is we've the same size squad as we had last year, numbers-wise. Yeah. But we, we, were too, we had too many defensive players and we didn't have enough attacking options. So last season, our main wingers would have been Michael Duffy, um, Daniel Kelly and John Milton. Um And we could have played Jamie there at different stages or even Patrick off one of them. We had to do that in Riga um, mm. when Michael wasn't available. So, but the difference now is we've got Nathan, Michael, uh, Stefan, Daniel Kelly, John Milton and um, Cammy Smith. W- with all of that, we've got one or two others who can play wide as well. So we've and we've we've added to our attack our attacking options. Patrick can play in the ten. Obviously, he can play in the eight. We've also changed our midfield. That Greg Sloggett can play as a six, no problem if she, if Shields is unavailable. So we now got real options in the forward areas. And um, ultimately, if you're going to win games, it's a lot of our games over the years have been one off the bench. People off the bench have made a real impact. And we've now like. We played when we played Shelbourne with five defenders on the bench. That's not the best way to set up to any game you go into. So we're now in a much stronger position, and I think with Will Patchen, uh, we're starting. We were starting to see w- what we really ho- hold him in the highest regard again. Number ten who can play either wide. So we're in a strong position going forward, and uh, very happy with the work we've done. And again, I have to say the backing of the board to go and. And, and flip the squad around so much it's, it's interesting and um, it, it is ready for a good a good um, go off this season yeah just just on that Vinny Steph, Stefan Kolovich obviously come off the bench against Finn Harps and that was the last game he's been he's been, he's been as I say he's been in the dock since so he, he'll be up to speed whenever you are back how good could he be and what can we expect there's, there's a lot of excitement around him the fact that he's, he's from He's from Serbia. He's not. He's not known around these parts. There's a, there's, that sort of gives a bit of mystique to it. But how good could could Stefan be? Well, I rang him today, and he, he answered by saying, "Well, how are you?" So <laughs> there. Well, he's, he's almost part of the community now. That's for sure. Um, listen, I, it'd be wrong me to put too much pressure on on anybody. Like Nathan and Stefan, uh, both can play in number number position. Stefan can play as a ten. He can play left wing. He's left-footed. Um, like our left winger currently is right-footed, and if Stefan was to start, he'd be left-footed playing right wing. There's logic to that. Okay, it allows our full-backs to get on, and that's where we're very, very best. What Stefan adds is that he mightn't be as quick as as some of our other wingers, but technically he's a proper European footballer who'll pick the pass. Who Holden will be excited by. He can cr- cross off the right or the left foot. Uh, Georgie Kelly would love his crosses, you know, the way Georgie attacks the ball so well in the box. So our players are excited about him. He's, he, he, he was in the country something like eight days before the Finn Harps game and it was the wrong venue for him, but he probably would have started against Pats. Mm-hmm. And um, 
who knows? Uh, I never put too much pressure on him. But we've watched him a lot, and we hold him in the highest regard. He's, he's somebody who, again, shows you the modern day player. He's fluent in Spanish, fluent in English, and obviously he's got his native tongue. So he's a very, um, very accomplished all around person, and, and that makes him for me a better footballer. He, he, he is. He's going to be a good talent. Stuff. I think everybody's excited to, to see him in full flow. Just go back. Um, you mentioned if Chris Shields was unavailable. Robbie Martin on Twitter. Um, interesting question. What what exactly happened with Chris Shields in the cup final last year and his suspension? Can you can you tell us what happened that that made made Chris unavailable? Obviously, he played in the court game, picked up a booking. But what was the the circumstances around the whole thing? Yeah, um, to be fair, I have said I'd answer that question one day and it hurts me still to this day, not not necessarily for what happened. I mean, it hurts that Chris got let down. There was, a, there was no doubt there was a mistake made. Um, the, the, there is, that rule will change. It won't happen again that a player won eight yellow cards. So obviously there's a flaw in the rule. Um, my understanding is... is is that for some reason the FAI rule wasn't changed? Okay, we should have known. I should have known that. Ultimately, uh, Chris not starting in the cup final is no one else's fault but mine. I have to take responsibility for it. Um, I had a different understanding of the rules, um, and ultimately I take the blame for it. Um, uh, you know, I've let, I've let Chris down, and it's something that I'm very conscious of. Um, was it the reason we lost the cup final? No, was a part of it. I don't know, but you know, we missed Patrick McElhenney and Chris Shields that day, and um, ultimately it cost us. To take responsibility for that. But uh, as you can see, big shoulders. I'll take it. I'll take it on on board, and we learn from it. And look, sometimes whether you like it or not, and it sounds a little bit grand, but you've got to fail sometimes to get better. Um, the best coaches, I think, have made mistakes and have failed at different stages, and they come back better for it. And um, I learn from it. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Fair play uh, for answering it. Um, just a couple of couple of ones, Vinny. Just sort of off. What do you do to chill out and for recreation? I can see a couple of books in the background, and I seen an article last week saying uh, we went through podcasts and books that you're reading. But um, you've got a bit of time in your hands now. Is that what you're into? Books and podcasts. Yeah, no, I am not that much into it. But in down times and something, if you can learn from it, do like. Yesterday morning, I would have went for. I ran for just over ten kilometers. Today, I've done absolutely nothing. Just set up the back garden. Uh, we all have different ways, particularly now of, of coping. Not a big binger on TV, any of that stuff. Um, to be honest with you, if you're not sitting at, at a kitchen table like I am now till two or three in the morning, whether you're a CEO of a company or you have your own company or you're a football manager then you're doing something wrong mm-hmm. uh, a couple of days a week you've got you've just got to be obsessed by it it's um, if you're not obsessed by the game you're not obsessed by coaching you're not obsessed by your players remember I manage close on 30 people with all the different things going on this takes up enough of my time the odd time I take the brain I'll put it in the fridge and I'll, I'll watch something um, but by and large don't I know there is actually books behind me, yeah, but I don't tend to overread um, small bits at different stages. And this podcast would only be while I'm exercising or, or traveling on the bus. Yeah. And just the, the final questions in Marie McMahon. Um, I suppose it's, it's relevant to what's after happening in the, the last week. Do you have ambitions to follow in your predecessor's footsteps and Hopefully one day take charge of your, your your country. Would that be would that be something that you'd have ambitions to do? And and do you think the fact that Stevens after coming from League of Ireland and taking the obviously the twenty ones job and obviously the senior job after that, but do you think it's it's there wouldn't be as much of a stigma sort of attaching it to League of Ireland managers going straight to the international team? Um, I suppose the answer to that is only if he, if he if he's anyway successful. If he's not successful, I would say. League of Ireland coaches back a long time. I think it's good that someone from League of Ireland has had this chance. Um, it's good for the young up and coming coaches, people like you know Keith Long, myself, Stephen Bradley. We'd all look at this and say, "I hope he does well." And and it's the same as players doing well, like in in our league, that 
other people notice what players do. Um, like, genuinely, I don't tend to think that far ahead. I've got a huge amount of work to do at, at Dundalk. I believe we can become a European club. I believe we can go on to the next level. I believe we've got um, the right owners, the right board members. The, we've got to improve certain things around our infrastructure and on the pitch. I've got to make the team better um, with the rest of the staff and the players. So I've a hell of a lot to achieve, a hell of a lot to achieve at this club before I could even consider anything like that. But um, I have massive goals for, for, for Dundalk and I want to be um, coaching in, in Europe with this club and, and again, being successful uh, domestically. Uh, that'll look after itself if, if we get the European stuff right. So a lot of goals to, to achieve before I'd even consider that. Yeah. And just, I suppose, a better throw this in. Uh, speaking of Stephen Kenny, have you ever lost your favourite jumper in a coffee shop? <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't drink coffee, so I'm not too bad. Um, uh, I do get, I, I believe there's been a lot of talk about some of my knitwear lately. I don't know where that's come from. So, so, someone shared that with me. But um, listen, um, I'm more of a grandfather colour man, and um, I'm, I'm generally in Dundalk clothes. Uh, because by the time we got home, it's not worth changing. So, no, pretty, pretty plain Jane. Uh, nothing too extravagant. And don't be hanging around those coffee shops. Uh, they're not good for you. Good stuff. <laughs> Vinny, thanks a million. Um, now, we're going to give away a signed picture for your, the best question. What, which question. Which of those questions, Yank, was the, the best? Just so nobody can say I fixed it. Um, no, the one has the game changed. I, I, I love debating that. Um, I think it's a huge... It's a huge um, sort of uh, part of the game. So the, I was asked earlier on, do I, do I feel the game has changed? So I absolutely think it has. And I think that was that's a very relevant question. First question is from Evan Gilson. And so Evan, we'll, we'll get Vinny to sign a picture whenever whenever we're back to normal. Hopefully, hopefully it's sooner rather than later. Vinny, thanks a million for taking part. Um, Obviously, you don't have much else to be doing on a Saturday night at this moment in time. But th thanks a million for taking part, and hopefully we're all Is back. It, it's Saturday, yeah, it's Saturday. Yeah, Saturday. Yeah, it's one. So, so, it, so I believe. So I believe. No, look, my, my, I suppose my final message is look, um, the dog. One of my, one of my sort of ambitions since I've taken over, and particularly at the back end of the season, is that we reach out to the community a little bit more. Um, it's not that I do it. Um, I, I I can't do it. It's not. I, I'm busy enough. So people in our in our club have have been brilliant in reaching out to the community. People like Eilish Kelly. And I suppose the message I'm sending out now is like we're here. We're 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 despite what people will tell you, this club is built should be and is built around the community. That's the way our owners feel and our board members feel and. Uh, this is the time that the community sticks together. And if we can help in any way, just contact the club. We'll help um, as best we can. And I just want everyone to stay safe and get back to Oriel soon enough. And um, we, we'll be looking forward to hear the shed gone bananas and the few lads moaning at the back of me as well. I miss them. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I'll say that in jest, obviously. So I look forward to being back in Oriel and uh, everyone stay safe and well. Brilliant. Vinny, thanks a million. Thanks, thanks for sharing your time. Thanks, talk to you soon. Here's...